Good Wednesday evening. This is Pastor Jordan at Park Avenue Baptist Church in El Dorado. Uh, week two of a journeying through a book during Lent um, by Robert Morris and the Blessed Life, um, unlocking the secret of generous living. But uh, this is March 16th, and I have watched the news reports more than once today, and it is not without angst and aching for the hurt and the bloodshed and the senseless violence uh, in Arcadia. So I want to start by just reflecting on some scriptures that tell us what God uh, has done, and I'm praying for God to intervene again. I think of the Jer Jericho when Joshua fought the Battle of Jericho and, and God gave them instructions to march around the city seven times and then the last day to blow the horns and the walls came down. Or the, the prophet, and I apologize if I get my uh, Elijah or Elisha, um, who had the competition with um, the uh, the prophets of Baal, and they and he says, "No, I, I'm your your uh, your your gods are not real. They were created gods. They're not uh, living." And they had this competition where they had two uh, um, altars for sacrifice and um, the the prophets from Baal went first and they sacrificed the appropriate uh, the appropriate uh, what they thought were the appropriate animals in the appropriate way and um, put them on the altar and the the challenge was from Elijah was to have them pray God their gods to come down and burn up the uh, burn up the sacrifice without lighting the fire and they tried and they tried and they tried and it didn't happen and when Elijah's turn came uh, he put the sacrifice up there they dug a, a, a ditch around the altar um, and put the wood there and they doused that altar was so much water that it filled up the the ditch around the uh, the altar and just soaked the wood and everything on it. And then he prayed to God, and God brought down fire and not only burned up the sacrifice, but burned up every bit of water that had been there. The number of uh, stories we could tell about. God confusing the enemy to fight against themselves. We, have, we, we serve a living God. And I am, I'm just aching for what's going on uh, in that region of the world. And I'm, I'm praying tonight for a God intervention. And if I would have a challenge for you is to Humble yourself before God. Say the prayer of, of Psalm 51.10. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Confess the things that you are trying to keep from God. It didn't work. Because the scriptures also tell us the prayer of a righteous person avails much. But my righteousness that I have is not based on my perfection it's because I connect my heart and soul with Jesus and it's his righteousness that I am holding on to so let me offer a prayer and I pray and challenge and encourage you to pray every day this week for God to intervene in some way uh, to stop the senseless killing and madness and war Let's pray. 
Father God, we thank you for your love. We thank you for your son, Jesus. We thank you for your Holy Spirit and that you care deeply for us and the people of Ukraine. Lord, we know if the battles we have are not against flesh and blood, but against the principalities, those spiritual forces that are causing the people, the evil to be done. And I ask you, Jesus, humbly and boldly, that you would stop the madness, break off the ties from those, the evil that is causing the just terrible uh, deaths of humanity of innocent people. Help us, Lord. Change the hearts of the those who are conducting the evil. Talk to them in a dream. Confuse them so they cannot do what they're being asked to do. I pray, Lord, for a God intervention to stop this madness through your means, any means that are from God and that you'd receive the glory. For these things and so much more, I unite together in my brothers and sisters in Christ in the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I just felt compelled to offer that time of prayer because God knows what's going on. And even though my study isn't talking particularly about the things of the world, it does deal with real uh, challenges. And I just, I, and the, the topic I'm going to look at to start into tonight uh, from the second chapter of this book is, uh, God must be first. And, you know, some people in this day and age are saying, well, that's, you know, does God have a self-esteem issue if he has to be first? Uh, someone wiser than me first said it, you know, I believe one reason we were created that way and the expectation is that we have God first is that God is the only being that won't abuse that privilege that, uh, can handle us. And there was one other. Think about that. He's the only one that fills the gap that we need to be filled, have filled. So I shared uh, in church Sunday. So if you hear this after my message, uh, this is a little bit of repeat, just reminding us that there are more than 500 verses in the Bible concerning prayer and nearly 500 concerning faith. But there are more than 2,000 verses concerning the subject of money and possessions. Jesus talked about money in 16 of his 38 parables. So this says that God thinks it's important. And he, we need to understand money and how to handle it. Why? Why, why, why? And again, for those of you who might want to join me sometime in person, I've got some uh, hard copies that uh, you can you can read along with as we share this time together. I argue with the author on this chapter, but it, but some most of this is food for thought. It's not a magic potion. 
but it talks about what occurs when we take our relationship with God seriously and he's first. So Robert here says, reminds us that God uses money as a test. It's a test from God. And if you think about the scriptures, uh, this, is, this is close, very close to the truth, I believe. How you handle money reveals lots and lots about the priorities, loyalties, and affections we have. The reality is it directly dictates, and that's where I argue about him, uh, with him about him. I wouldn't use that. He says dictates many of the blessings you will or won't experience in life. I think when we don't uh, do things genuinely uh, in response to God's love for us, uh, this kind of like cholesterol, spiritual cholesterol, it clogs up the full extent of what God would like to, to show us. But the, um, so dictates, I, I, would have, I wouldn't use that, but that's what Robert uses. The very principle, he says, we must grasp if we are to understand giving is the principle of first fruits. And this is something that I think must have been taught when I was a kid, but we don't teach it a lot because um, it's just, it's, it's a challenge. And we, that's not where we are as a, a body of Christ for the most part or a body of believers. And, and uh, we don't want to hear it. We don't want to listen to that. There might be more to the life we are living as a follower of Christ than we are experiencing. And so when I share his thoughts here, think about it this way, that um, is it possible that there is more of the life that God intends for us to live than we are living right now? I believe this is, what he's saying is, there's so much more that God wants to show us. So here, um, the first principle he talks about in this chapter is first fruits. Of the firstborn, firstborn or the tithe. And again, I argue with some of this, but I want to share what he did. Then I'll reflect a little bit as I go. He says that too many Christians are confused about tithing and the principle of first fruits. Uh, and, and right here, he says that I'm going to ask you to do the same thing. This is in uh, parentheses. Please don't tune me out, turn me off, or skip the following pages. Thinking I've heard all that tithing talk, all that stuff before. Therefore, there is life. Um, there is life giving, liberating truth in what he's about to present in the pages that follow. So don't miss out. So so pay attention. Maybe just maybe. God has something more to share with us. Sacrificed or redeemed is the first topic. Uh, next topic. We find an important financial uh, precedent, I think he says, or uh, rule of thumb. In the 13th chapter of Exodus, God says in uh, Exodus 13, verse 2, consecrate to me all the firstborn. Whatever opens the womb among the children of Israel, both of man and beast, it is mine. Here, God would seem to plainly say or declare that the firstborn is mine. It belongs to him. In fact, we find God declaring this 16 times. I'm glad someone like him goes through and counts all these in scripture that the firstborn is God's. For example, Exodus 13, 12 and 13, verses 12 and 13 reads that you shall set apart to the Lord all that open the womb, that is, every firstborn that comes from an animal which you have. And the males shall be to the Lord's. But every firstborn of a donkey shall redeem with the lamb. 
And if you will not redeem it, then you shall break its neck. And all the firstborn of man among your sons you shall redeem. And I believe the sons, you know, in that culture, uh, there, there was the sons, the first, by, for the most part, the, the first male was received the inheritance and things like that. But this, I want you to think, hear that sons today is mankind. So the offspring. I think that fits with the principles of what he's teaching here. It is vital that you understand something about the principles of firstborn, Morris says. According to the Old Testament law, the firstborn was to be either sacrificed or redeemed. This, I think he was, this is well read, well written here. So keep listening. Um, there was no third option. Every time one of your livestock animals delivered its firstborn, you were to sacrifice it, or it was designated unclean. You had to redeem it with a clean, spotless lamb. Now, if we sum that up, the clean firstborn had to be sacrificed, and the unclean firstborn had to be redeemed. It took care of one. So with that in mind, that's why I say, please, let's, I'm trying to uh, read and kind of talk about this as clearly as I can, because it's, 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 for me, it's deep, too. But with that in mind, though, think about the account of the New Testament in which John the Baptist meets Jesus on the banks of the Jordan River. John was baptizing one day and looked up to see Jesus walking towards him. At that point, John cried out, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John chapter 1, verse 29. With that inspired declaration, John perfectly, accurately defined the role Jesus had come to fulfill. The Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Jesus was God's firstborn. I really hadn't thought about this context until um, I got into this book recently. But God, it's, Jesus was God's firstborn. Jesus was clean, perfect, and unblemished in every way. On the other hand, every one of us is born, was born unclean. We were all born sinners with a fully active sin nature. Some people who argue with that, um, with, oh, it's babies. Well, <laughs> put it this way. There's no one born into this world who can uh, avoid the impact of sin on their life and the presence of sin in the world. All right, now let's think back to the first, um, the principle of the firstborn in Exodus again. Remember the law stated that if the firstborn animal was clean, it was to be sacrificed. But if the firstborn was unclean, it was to be redeemed with a clean animal. This, there's a little symbolic parallel here, I believe. Jesus Christ was God's firstborn son, and he was born clean. He was born a pure, spotless lamb. But every one of us was born unclean. Therefore, Jesus was sacrificed to redeem us. And this is also appropriate to talk about because we are in the season of Lent. When Jesus redeemed us by his sacrifice, he bought us back for God. He was literally a first, first fruits offering. That's uh, Morris's description here. And really, that, that, 
that's a fascinating to think about. I think it's, it's, it's on target. In a very real sense, Jesus was God's tithe to us. To, or back to himself, whatever you want to call it, but Jesus was God's first fruits, his tithe. God has his tithe, Jesus, gave his tithe, Jesus, in faith before we ever believed. And we still have to accept that. But notice that God gave him to us before we believe. Romans 5, 8, remember that? God demonstrates his own love toward us. And that while he was still sinners, Christ died for us. Thank you, Jesus. We have to give our first fruits offerings, our tithes, in much the same way, Robert uh, Morris writes. Before we see the blessings of God, we give it in faith. Now, I argue with that a little bit because it's almost like uh, or we can hold God hostage or uh, God's going to hold us hostage. Do we have to give the money first before he'll bless us? Well, but it's, hear me out. He is talking about how money shows God and shows ourselves where our priority, priorities are. Is God first? What is first in our life? So keep listening and prayerfully ask God to open your eyes to see what of this that perhaps you hadn't thought of before. Because I think oh, there's so much more that God wants to show us. And perhaps even if you've journeyed with God for a long time than what we currently are experiencing. Well, let's keep going here. I wouldn't use the term we have, but until we give those first fruits to God, our spiritual priorities are not going to be where they need to be for God to really uh, open the floodgates. You heard me say there's spiritual cholesterol that needs to be cleaned out before God can really, really do something special or show us who he is. God gave Jesus in faith that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. That's uh, Romans 8, 29. And I'm reading the scripture verses he has here. And I'm not sure what translation he has, but I think it's probably uh, English Standard Version. Anyway, let's continue. I want to keep this fairly brief each week. Um, so in this sense, Jesus is God's tithe. I like that phrase, in this sense. God gave Jesus first in faith. Even when we were sinners, even as we were mocking him and spitting in his face while he was dying. And I think of the, um, the, the, the actor who produced um, The Passion. For some reason, his, his name is escaping me at the moment, but he said the only place you see him on camera was he was the hands that were nailing Jesus to the cross. He said that was the only, Mel Gibson, that was the only thing that he felt worthy enough to portray in that movie. God didn't wait to see if we would first change or repent to make ourselves worthy. He knew the principle of first things. He knew how important it is for us to have our priorities in order. Think about this. Have you ever wondered how God could justify taking the lives of Egyptian firstborns in the final plague described in Exodus? It is because the firstborn belongs to him. And set that aside a minute and let me put a personal note. And it, uh, what about those children who die, those people who die uh, without uh, no fault of their own, but before they have a chance to know and make a decision for Christ? I believe that those who die 
at least in that I'm thinking of children, uh, God's grace is sufficient and God will uh, welcome them in. Uh, just I'll put that now. Let's go back on track on this track here. Um, God, Robert writes, uh, Morris writes, had a legal right to take every firstborn because every one of them in Egypt and in Israel belonged to him. Uh, we all, uh, all of creation belonged to him. But this, in the context of his first fruits, hear me out here. But the firstborn in Israel didn't die that night, did they? Passover, with the blood of the lamb, put on the doorpost. Why not? Because the lamb was sacrificed to redeem them. A spotless, perfect lamb took their place. Remember that God instructed Moses to apply the blood of the sacrificed lamb to the doorpost of each home. They were to apply the blood to the mantle, the top of the door frame, and on the, the posts, the sides of the door frame. Exodus 12, 7. Just imagine yourself for a minute. And uh, I love this, the pictures that uh, Reverend Morris paints in this. Just imagine ourselves for a minute outside of one of these doors, dipping a hyssop branch in lamb's blood, applying the blood first to the left side of the door frame, then going across and applying it to the right side and then reaching up and applying it, the blood to the middle of the mantle on the top. So the blood would then drip down. And see, as Robert describes that, I probably didn't do my actions right. That's kind of like doing the sign of the cross. Well, anyway, that, that thought that was a neat imagery. Uh, Israelites were saved by the blood of the lamb in the form of a cross. And that's precisely how we are saved. God redeemed us in the same way by giving his firstborn son as a sacrifice. Let that sink in a minute. The principle of first fruit. For, First fruits is very, very powerful. Morris writes, I have heard it said that any first thing given is never lost. And anything, any first thing not given is always lost. So why not give the first of our day, of our energy, of our finances, to God, I'll never be lost. And he has a little more to say about that to put some meat to the bones of this. In other words, what we give to God, we don't lose because God redeems it for us. But what we withhold from God, we will lose. And Jesus echoed that principle. And I'm also thinking of the, the two, the couple that tried to, Cheap God, they said, I sold this much, I sold this land, I got this much money, but that wasn't how much money they got. Why would we try to out <laughs> trick God? God who gave his first fruits, his son to us. Okay. Jesus writes, Matthew 16, 25, and this is NIV. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me. We'll find it. So we'll see if we give our life to him. God redeems it through Christ. If we hold it. Say so, no. Uh, my. Ultimately we're going to lose it. Because it's not redeemed. The first belongs to God. We find this principle all through the Bible. We can give God the first of our time. 
and give God the first of our finances. That's what tithing really is, giving our first, period, to God. Can you imagine, just imagine that this is what God wants us to do. But we've been listening to the other voices in the world and watching perhaps those who aren't really taking their relationship with God as a follower of Christ seriously. And they maybe spend everything on their on themselves as they need to do. And then if 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 there's anything left over, they give their time, money, whatever to God. More see that just backwards. <laughs> Uh, let's see. Put it another way. Here, here's a good one. It's it's saying that God, I'm I'm going to give to you first, and trust you to redeem the rest. Or, when a firstborn lamb is born to a flock, it is not possible to know how many lambs. Think about this that you might produce. So. God didn't say, let you, you produce nine lambs and then give me the next one. <laughs> we don't know how many it's going to produce. No, God says, give me the first one. It always requires faith to give the first. Um, is it? That's why so few Christians, I believe, experience the blessing of tithing. I have learned so much from others when I've seen them put that priority in their lives. And it, it, it changes their whole countenance, their whole attitude, their, their being. It, it just, it shows in everything they do. They are a generous individual. And next week, I'm going to try to find that book about a story about a man who gave 51% of his business to God. People thought he was nuts. In fact, uh, the first uh, person he tried to get to write all the paperwork legally to make that happen so that 51% of the business went to God, wouldn't do it or couldn't do it. But he did, and God blessed that, I believe, because it made him a generous person after his own heart. Um, let's see. It requires faith to give the first. That's why so few of us, uh, so few people, <coughs> and I'm still learning. I'm, I'm still learning. Don't look at me as perfection. Look at Christ as perfection. It means giving to God before you see if you're going to have enough. You give first. By tithing, it is as if we are saying to God, I recognize you first. I am putting you first in my life. And I trust you to take care of the rest of the things in my life. That's what tithing. Why tithing is so important. It is the primary way that we acknowledge that God is first. And I think I read that story last week. If I didn't, I'll share it real quick again about the lady who heard uh, Mr. Morris talk, uh, who just started tithing and she was only making a thousand dollars either a week or a month i forget and she really had a hard time writing that first check but god kind of impressed our hearts that, that was important to do and then god kind of nudged her to give twenty dollars more and in the story as uh, reverend moore shares it it was the hundred the, the hundred dollars was the tithe giving back the 10 percent 20 and the 10 20 20 dollars more he encouraged her to give was the offering okay the first portion is the redemptive portion in other words when the first portion is given to god the rest is redeemed in the same way coming to church at the first of the week is a way of giving the Lord the first of our time. Yeah. 
River Morris writes here, sadly, some people view Monday as the beginning of the week, thinking, I have to get this week started right. I have to put some deals together and I get some, some money in the bank. So they give the first part of their week to money. Other people think their week begins on Friday. They say, man, this weekend is really going to, I'm going to party, have a good time. This mentality sees first fruits of their time as their time or recreation. As God's people, we need to give the first part of our week to Jesus. One reason, or if not the reason, that the New Testament church met on Sunday. Hey, it's, yes, it is. I'm a, on Sunday was because they were celebrating the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. I didn't look down far enough to have his wording. They gave the first of their time to God in worship. And I'm going to stop right there. Um, I know I haven't got a lot into this chapter, but I wanted to spend time in prayer for the Ukrainians. And I'm going to pray now for you. I don't know what God has put on your heart today. And join me again next week. Uh, again, you can send an email request to PAB, which stands for Park Avenue Baptist Register at gmail.com. And I'll send you a link. Or I'll send you a phone number where you can actually call in and uh, hear one another. And with the, if you use the video, you can uh, see each other. But you can just call in uh, with a phone and with the, and on Zoom. And I'm recording this on Zoom. And I'll be able to hear you. And you'll be able to hear me. And all you have to do is have a phone. And most uh, cell phones have unlimited uh, talk time. So it's not going to cost you anything. I just wanted to let you know that because the phone numbers that they have connected with Zoom are not local numbers, but uh, it's still doable. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the challenge of this book. I pray, Lord, that it, this week it will help me to unlock more of what it means to be uh, to live generously and that those who have received this uh, message but spend time with you and get to know how generous you are with your love, your wisdom. And Lord, again, we pray in Jesus' name, humbly that the, the madness, the brokenness, the, the brutal nature of the war and everything involved with that in, in Ukraine would stop. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. Hey, uh, if you got questions, please give me a call. 316-325-5858. Uh, we'll see you soon. Jesus loves you. And so do we. God bless. And I'll talk to you later. Bye. No, let's see if I can get this to stop. All right, bye-bye. <laughs>